Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are doing our presentation on starting a user experience revolution. My name is Paul Boag. Um, the obligatory thing to do when you do these kinds of things is to ask whether everybody can hear me loud and clear. If you could say so in the um, chat, that would be amazing. While you're doing that, I'm going to bring up my presentation. So you have a nice um, uh, screen appearing any second now. There it is. And let's uh, put my presentation over the top of it. So we are ready to go. Excellent. Good to um, have you here and uh, joining us today. Um, maybe we'll get some of you on um, in a minute after I've given the presentation to talk about um, any questions that you've got. But to begin with, we're going to start um, just by me saying that, uh, telling you a little bit about how this is going to work and how it's going to happen. So we're going to start off with me giving the presentation, a bit of an introduction into what I'm getting at with user experience revolution um, and what I'm driving at both in the book and in my other writings and in my culture cards and podcasts and all the other things I do. Um, so that's what we're, we're going to be looking at today. Then after that presentation, I want to open it up for Q&A and there will be a panel pretty much like the one that you're seeing right now on the screen um, that uh, essentially um, allows you to enter questions and vote people's questions up and down. So um, please make sure that you pop in your questions there. I see some of you have already done that, but make sure that you find that and add your questions. I may invite you to join me on the screen to to talk about those questions. Um, but if you don't want to do that, absolutely no problem at all. Don't worry about it. I understand, you know, some of you are at work and it's not appropriate, etc. So that is <coughs> the plan for the day. Let me have a look at my watch. Yes, we are now well and truly past the 4.30. So I think it is about time to kick off. Um, and today we are talking about my book, um, but not really. Um, Although I'm doing this workshop um, uh, to kind of celebrate the launch of the book, so to speak, it's not really the book I'm interested in pushing today. Um, rather, I'm interested in, well, doing what it says on the tin, really, starting a revolution, starting a revolution in how um, uh, our organizations treat user experience. And do you know what? This kind of all came to a head for me recently, or, or maybe not a head, that's not the right word, but a, a good example of this recently was the United Airlines fiasco, where, where a um, passenger was physically removed from a flight for no other reason than that uh, that passenger, they wanted the seats for their own staff to fly, fly the passenger there. Um, and it, what really struck me about that whole situation is I don't believe that anybody in the senior executive team at United Airlines, you know, could ever imagine that scenario happening or ever imagine um, that's what they wanted to happen. That if you'd ask them, do they care about their customers and their customers needs, they would have said, absolutely. It's a high priority to us that if you look at the people on the ground, that you know those those individuals that actually made this happen, I don't think any of them um, got up in the morning thinking, do you know what? Today I want to physically have someone dragged off of our plane. Instead, these things happen because of the culture of the organisation, right? That there's something in the culture that causes people to behave in a way that is in that case unethical um, uh, and probably illegal and um, but even without such a stream example you talk to the vast majority of organizations and they will tell you user experience is important but it's not happening and how do we go about changing that how do we change that reality so I want to begin really with with the blindingly obvious um, and the blindingly obvious here is a very simple statement, which is that our companies need to change. Um, we know they need to change. You know they need to change. You know that either your clients or if you're working in-house, the company you work for, really aren't making um, the, uh, 
you, they are providing the level of user experience, customer experience, whatever word you want to use, that, that they should be. And really, that was the topic of the previous book I did with Smashing Magazine called Digital Adaptation. It was a book primarily written for your managers or your clients to, to make the case that essentially that the world has changed um, and we need uh, to change the way that we behave as a result. Digital has changed it. Um, but I think from our perspective, as people with slightly more mature understanding of what is going on, it's not so much about digital transformation or digital adaptation or whatever you need, um, you want to, the word you want to use. But instead, what we need is for organizations to become more user centric, right? Because ultimately, um, if you look at the heart of what digital transformation is all about, this term that's been flying around for years, it boils down to the fact that customers have changed, customer behavior has changed because of digital. Um, and so as a result, customers have now have much higher expectations. We have a different working relationship with them in business. And we need to change and adapt. And we need to change and adapt to become more user-centric. And a lot of companies are really, really getting this. Um, here's an example. All right, in ten, in 10 years, a $10,000 investment in a design-centric company would yield returns 228% greater than the rest of the market, right? So in other words, companies that get and understand the need to be user-centric, to be design-focused and design-led, outperform the rest of the market by 228%. So there are hard numbers that say um, that this kind of thing is uh, important. 89% of retail customers have said they will or have stopped doing business with a company after a single poor customer experience. Customer behavior has changed. And the re reason it's changed is very simple, or there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is there is just so much competition out there now um, because they can instantly access every competitor in the marketplace using the web. So expectations are much higher. Tim Cook actually put it really good, where, where, really well, when he said that most business models um, have focused on self-interest rather than user experience. And this kind of worked um, in the, the kind of pre-digital age, right? You could afford um, to uh, have this constant churn of clients. You, you get clients in, you milk them for all their worth, spit them out the other end and get more clients in. Right. It was almost like a production line of, of extracting cash from client, uh, customers. And the reason that would work is because all the power laid with the company. Right. That if um, uh, if if the, uh, the the customer had a bad experience, they had very little recourse. Right. Typically, they would, um, if they had a very bad experience, they would complain to about seven to nine people about that experience on average. Okay. Today, the average person has 300 followers on Facebook. So suddenly they have a much bigger audience to talk to. On top of that, they can write reviews uh, um, and um, uh, make comment online. And the result is that we live in a much more user centric environment. So increasingly, this is becoming the focus for, for bigger players. There are a growing number of large organizations that are taking user experience massively seriously. People like General Electric, IBM, UK government. I mean, IBM are hiring something like 12,000 designers. So um, if you're ever worried as a designer whether, um, whether you need to worry about job security, don't worry, if you get fired from your current job, you can go and work for IBM, they're, they're desperate, they'll take anyone. Um, so there are a lot of organizations that are, are taking this design culture, this user-centric culture incredibly seriously. So if all of this stuff is so obvious, and we can get more into why it's like this and how it's like this in the Q&A times, if that's useful, but I'm guessing that most of you right, the 143 of you that are watching at the moment, I'm guessing most of you get what I've already said, all right? Get the importance of user experience, get the importance of being user-centric. So kind of all of that is obvious. 
But if it is so obvious, why is it not happening more? And the answer is simple, because change is really hard, especially organizational change. It's tough to do, and so therefore it doesn't tend to happen. This, this is a great quote um, from the president um, and CEO of Mercedes Benz, who said, culture and leadership and employee engagement are essential for great customer experience. So what he was saying by that is that there are these kind of fundamental things that have got to be right to create a great customer experience. He talked about culture, leadership, and employee engagement. But changing a culture, changing leadership, and changing employees' uh, minds within an organization is really, really tough. So even if your senior management team got it, right? I've worked with organizations, I work with one organization, whose senior management team absolutely understood the need um, to invest in user experience. They made it a primary directive of the organization, right? And said, it is our number one um, goal. Yet nothing happened. And the reason nothing happened is because culture wasn't right. The culture was fundamentally set against users and user needs. Employees weren't engaged with it. They didn't understand why this was important. They were just told it was. So as a result, you've got to get the whole package in place. So let's look at some of the reasons why um, uh, we don't see more customer-centric organizations that your clients and your own business maybe are not as focused on user needs as they should be. Well, one area is poor leadership. Um, many organizations um, have leadership teams that are so caught up in um, providing shareholder value or meeting targets or dealing with their own internal crap that they're not looking at their users. They're not seeing their users. The other thing that is a big deal is the bigger that a company grows, the less contact those senior management have with customers. And, and so if they're not spending time with customers, they're not seeing customers' problems, they're not encountering um, uh, the, the, the negativity that's being spread about um, uh, by the customers. So there is a real lack of leadership within organizations. And even those that do get the value of user experience are not sure how to change, how to change the organization. So leadership is one problem. Another problem is out of date structures within organizations, these departmental silos. And each departmental silo has its own objectives, the own, own things that it's been given to do, right? Marketing is just interested in driving more leads. Sales is just interested in converting those leads. Finances are just interested in keeping costs down. IT is just interested in security and risk management. And when all of these different um, uh, silos are working in their own areas to their own objectives, who represents the customer? Who cares about the customer and the customer's needs and the customer's wants? So there's out of date structures that need to be dealt with. And then there are fundamentally incompatible cultures. Cultures um, that just aren't designed to put um, the user first. Now, culture kind of fits into two elements. There is the official culture, which revolves around the things that people are assessed on, right? And then there's unofficial, right, um, culture, things that have just grown up in the company. And I'll give you two examples of each, or one example of each. Uh, official types of cultural problems that you can encounter. Okay. One, one project I was working on, I wanted to, it was agreed with the, the, the client of this large organization, we would launch a blog, right? They really needed a blog um, just for a, for a short-term event. It wasn't a long-term thing, it was a, sh a short-term thing. And so I said to the client, well, let's just fling up a Squarespace blog, right? Get it up and running quickly. Only takes about 10 minutes to get it up and running. You can start putting content out there. I know it, some of you are cringing now at me saying a Squarespace space blog, but trust me, it was appropriate. I won't get into the details of why. So um, I said, oh, well, do you want me to set it up for you? And they said, no, 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 it's all right. We'll do it because then it could be on our card and we'll be charged for it rather than you. Two weeks later, nothing had happened. And I said, what, what happened to that Squarespace blog we were going to set up? Ah, well, yes. 
Well, finance didn't want to put it on a credit card. They wanted to be invoiced. Um, legal were concerned about the American terms and conditions. Um, the IT department was worried about the risk of it being hacked. And, and so it went on, you know. Now, I actually told that story at an internal conference at that organization, right, about you know, how this was blocked and that there wasn't this fast moving culture that this user centric design led culture. And I finished my presentation, everybody laughed when, when I told the story and kind of, you know, it was, it was funny. Well, I say everybody, when I finished the presentation and I came off the stage, this woman walked, I, well not walked, she marched across to me, um, daggers and death on her face. So I was obviously in trouble. And she came up to me and she said, I was the person that blocked it from IT. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I hope I didn't embarrass you. Um, I said, can, can I ask, what, why did you block it? What was the problem as far as you were concerned? Um, and she said, well, what would have happened if that site had been hacked by ISIS and they had put up information that damaged our brand and damaged who we are? And that was her reason for blocking it. Um, the reason I tell that story is because the, the culture, the official culture of the organization led her to think like that. And the reason it led her to think like that is she was assessed not on customer needs, not on being user centric, not even on making the company profitable. She was assessed on risk. She was assessed on security. If that site had been hacked, right? She would have been fired. So she didn't care about any other metrics. She didn't care about how unlikely or otherwise that was. All she cared was that that site was secure. So that's an example of an official um, metric. In terms of unofficial things that I've seen before, often organizations um, develop characteristics based on things that may have happened years and years ago. I've seen two departments fight with one another. And it turns out that those departments have been fighting for 10 years. And ironically, they, if you go back to the root of why they were fighting originally, it was because two managers didn't like one another. Two managers that have left the company five years ago, yet they're still fighting because that has been embedded in the culture. Another example was of a, um, a, a client that I worked with where there was this culture of fear. Everybody was fearful um, and, uh, of, of being um, getting into trouble over stuff, despite the senior management saying time and time again, we want you to take risks, to try stuff, to do things differently. There was a culture of fear that prevented people. So there are these cultural elements. But we can change, and this is, this is the heart of what I want to get across today. We can change our companies if we're willing to play the long game, right? And that's what I want us to embrace, all right? I want us to stop being developers, designers, information architects, copywriters, project managers, and I want us to become revolution, re revolutionaries. No, that's not right, is it? Revo yeah, anyway, whatever. I want us to start a revolution, and I want us to begin the process of change, and we might not see the end of it, because it is going to be a long game, but I want us to at least start it, to start changing our organizations, and I'll get more into that um, and why that is. So where do we begin? How do we begin? Well, this is where we kind of get into some of the, the content of the book that I am, obviously I'm, it covers a lot more detail in the book, but I'll give you the highlights. First of all, we need to start by finding like-minded people, all right? The trouble is, is that often we can exist in isolation within our businesses. We can feel like we're the only person that gets user experience, that wants to create a better user experience, but that is not true. There are other people within your organizations um, who care about user experience as much as you. Now, they might not call it that. They might not know that they care about user experience, but they fundamentally do, right? So these people um, might be in marketing 
or sales or in customer support. All of these, these departments have contact regularly with the customer and have to deal with their complaints and their problems and all of those kinds of stuff. So the very first thing I want to encourage you to do if you, if you work inside of an organization is to get out of your department. Start finding and seeking out like-minded people. If you work outside of an organization um, and you've got clients, don't just work with your one point of contact. Try and meet and engage with as many people across the organization as you can, especially those who uh, um, care about the user experience, even in some small way. Then once you've, you've kind of got this group of people together, and I would encourage you to find a mechanism for you to talk um, with one another. So it might be, you know, uh, a, a weekly meetup, right? It might be um, an email mailing list. It might be a Slack group or, a, a, you know, whatever. Have a place where you can talk together as a group of people. But just kind of opening up a discussion isn't going to be enough. You're, you're quickly, it could quickly dis, uh, descend into moaning about how nobody in the organization gets it. And, and, you know, and then you're going to run out of steam and run out of conversation and you'll all go your separate way. So you need something to unite around and work around. So what I suggest is as a group, you start looking at putting together some shared values. All right. Um, some you know shared things that you 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 want to do as a group. So I don't know whether you've seen things like the digital service playbook from the U.S. government um, or the U.K. version, the uh, digital service manual. They're essentially principles, uh, a set of principles that um, you can build your organisation on. You can uh, you can build your your manifesto for change around, right? Things like understanding what people need, addressing the whole experience from start to finish, making it simple and intuitive. So nice little kind of nuggets that summarize what it is that you guys want. Because we're really good at complaining, right? And saying, oh, nobody gets user experience. But we're not good at showing them what better would be like, to explaining how it should be. So a set of shared principles is a good starting point for that. Then once you've done that, it's then about beginning to raise the profile of the customer within your organization. And there are so many different ways you can do this. So for a start, you can start running um, the regular usability testing um, so, uh, so that you can um, invite people across the organization to come and see that usability testing. Because as soon as you manage to get users, uh, your colleagues in front of users, then they will quickly come around to understanding and being more user centric, right? So ideally you wanna get them in front of customers. Now in a perfect world, you wanna take those colleagues and you wanna take them into the, the user's place of work and, and, or at home and actually see how they live and see what they do. I know that's fairly unlikely. So the next option down from that is get them to observe usability testing. Get them to come in and watch usability testing every week or every month or however often have this open um, approach to usability testing. And if you want to know more about that, I highly recommend Steve Krug's book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy. All right. See, I'm not just pimping my book. Um, failing that, if you can't do that, if you, um, you record the usability sessions, you edit together a, a low lights reel of all the most painful and um, uncomfortable bits that people have said, and you distribute that around to your colleagues. Failing that, Start creating personas and empathy maps, right? Here's a challenge for you. I haven't yet had anyone take me up on this challenge. Go ahead and create a set of personas or, or empathy maps, right? Make them nice and pretty, okay? Make them look gorgeous. Frame them up and then sneak into your offices at night and take down all of those um, pictures that are up on the wall in your offices, all those awards that you've won, all those important executives shaking hands, all those pictures of buildings and, and those internal looking things, the things that say, hey, look at us, look at all the achievements we have made. Take all those down, right, put them in a cupboard somewhere and replace them with personas, replace them with empathy maps, replace them with your customers, right? Don't tell anyone you've done it. And then let that 
to you know become a point uh, a discussion point in the organization because it will get people but well, they'll be they'll be thinking about who did this and all of that kind of thing but they'll also be thinking about the customers so there are lots of different kind of guerrilla methods you can use to raise the customer's profile from newsletters to blogs to videos everywhere they look replace everybody's screensavers with with pictures of customers whatever it takes to get the customer in front of people and then create a vision of the future all right if you want people to be if you you talk about the user experience right and how great the user experience could be or even write about it it a lot of people can we're very visual people and a lot of us can't get our heads around that kind of thinking right uh, uh, that can't think in that way that can't picture what you're describing so you need to show them right you might show them through a customer journey map like like you're seeing on the screen now but even better would be a prototype or a demo so let me tell you a story in disney a group of people came up with an idea they came up with the idea for the disney magic band a, a band that would improve the experience of people visiting the park and their idea was that people would wear a band around their wrist and it would have an rdf chip in it and that rdf chip would enable them to create a delightful experience for customers customers wouldn't need to carry around their wallet and worry about it getting stolen because they can pay for everything using their rdf band okay they could they wouldn't have to worry about losing hotel keys because they could open their door with their RDF band. That because their park knew where people were in the park and who they were, if it was your little daughter's birthday, um, M uh, Mickey could actively go and find your daughter in the park, knowing the location based on the RDF chip, go up to your daughter and wish her happy birthday by name. Okay. So that, yeah, there were all these opportunities. Another one was um, you could pre-order your food for the restaurant. Go up to the restaurant. As you're walking towards the restaurant, the maitre d' would, would have you, your picture and your name pop up on their screen as you were walking up, could greet you by name, tell you to sit anywhere you wanted in the restaurant, and then the food comes straight to your table because they know where you're sitting. All of these opportunities, you know, to say, hey, this ride is now um, free and you're not far from it. It's only got a two-minute wait. Why don't you go to that ride then? So it opened up all these opportunities. But to do this, they needed to redo everything in the parks, from the hotel doors to the, um, the, the catering systems to everything. And it was going to cost an Austin Powers number. It was going to cost $1 billion to achieve. So they could have gone to management with a business plan outlining all of this. But instead, they took an empty lot at Disney and they built a cardboard um, version of the park with cardboard hotel doors, with cardboard restaurants. And they brought the executive in and they put cardboard um, uh, magic bands around their wrists and they led them around and they made them put their, their wrist against the hotel door, which then went beep and, or somebody behind the door went beep and opened it. They showed them the experience rather than telling them about it. So they created a vision of what a better experience looks like. And I see this kind of problem all the time. Sorry, this, this presentation is going on a bit, isn't it? I see this uh, problem all the time. Um, the people that redesign a website and you, you end up being constrained by legacy, by culture, by what content is available, by what technology is available, all of these kinds of things. And as a result, you end up with a subpar user experience. So instead, next time, build a prototype, all right? a disposable prototype. You say, I just need you know, a few days just to mock up something. And you, build, you create the content. You ignore the legacy system you've got to be integrated in. You just do the best user experience. Because when people can see that experience, they get excited about it. And they're much more willing to do what is required to to make that experience happen. They're much more willing to change and to compromise and to say, well, perhaps we need to replace this legacy system. Perhaps we need to invest more time in the content because, wow, I really want that. It's really exciting. But most of all, it changes the discussion around from being you having to justify why you, this is done to them having to justify why it sh can't be done. You see the difference? So create a vision for your future. 
Next, of course, the big challenge is getting management on board, all right? Now, notice we've already done a lot of things without talking to management. And I would encourage you, I think we often go to management too quickly, right? So we rush to talk to management um, because we feel we have to get their permission. I would encourage you to leave it as late as possible to go to management, right? And the reason I want to suggest that is for a couple of reasons. One is it gives you a chance to mature your ideas and your thinking. Two, you go to them with something tangible to show them of a better way. Three, you can begin to build momentum within the organization. There's a lot of buzz and excitement about user experience. Four, you've got, you're going as a group of colleagues of like-minded people rather than just as one individual. So hold back before you go to management. When you do go to management, don't just give them problems, right? Don't just say, oh, we've got all these issues with user experience. Instead, go to them with solutions. Go to them with positive things that need to be changed. Sure, paint them a picture of what a great future would look like, right? What that Disney magic band experience would be look, look like. But don't then turn around and say, so if you'll sign a check for $1 billion, that'll be great because they're not gonna do it. They're gonna bury their heads in the sand. Instead, ask for a small next ask. Ask for a week to do some more prototyping. Ask for them to spend half a day run on a, in a workshop with you, all right? So lots of little steps, rather than making them, asking them for a big commitment because you'll find them much more willing to. And the more little steps they take, the more engaged they're gonna become and the more likely they are to follow through, all right? And it's, I've covered so much more in the book, but that gives you an idea. And then the time comes to develop a proof of concept, all right? So this is more than a prototype. This is actually um, you, a, a, a time for you to demonstrate tangible returns um, on, on providing user-centric uh, user design thinking to the organization. Hang on a minute. So, um, so that might be taking one small part of the site, right? Or a mobile app or whatever it be, and applying modern design principles, um, user-centric thinking to this particular thing, whatever this thing is. Oftentimes, bizarrely, I find it good to start with an internal tool, all right? Why is that? Well, because then your colleagues are seeing the benefit of user experience design to them personally. So let's say you, um, you applied user-centric design thinking, modern design practices to something like an expenses claim system, right? Everybody has filling in expenses. And if you can demonstrate a way, oh, look, if we work in this kind of way, look how simple we can make this. Look how pleasurable we can make this. Now we've done it for you, let's do it for the customer. Also, it's lower risk working on internal projects because um, they're willing to make more mistakes because it's not gonna be in front of your external audience. But if it is for an external audience, and I'm not saying it shouldn't be, Make sure it's really measurable. Make sure you can see and show the return on investment that comes with that. So by this stage, you've, you've got management on board. You've, you've created a buzz and movement within the organization. I realize I've skipped over a lot of stuff here. Um, you've built a proof of concept. People are beginning now to understand the, um, the value of um, user-centric thinking with the organization. Now's the time when you need to start shifting culture and shifting org uh, organizational thinking. So one of the things that you will need to look at alongside your CM management is how people are assessed, okay? What are different departments assessed on? Is there a user-centric and customer satisfaction rating that you are being assessed on as individuals? Is your bonus dependent on how many risks you've taken or how many experiments you've done? How we measure people will affect how they perform within an organization and the emphasis they put, just like that woman and her ISIS story, okay? So it's an area that as you become more advanced in this, as you begin to 
to, to get momentum within the organization, you will have to start looking at. But obviously, you're a long way away from that. And no doubt you feel well, it's not your responsibility to deal with all of this kind of stuff. And it absolutely isn't. You're not going to be changing the metrics within the organization. But management aren't necessarily even going to realize they need to be changed. And even once you've got them on board and you've got them enthusiastic, they're going to need support and advice about how to change a culture, how to become more user centric. What that even means, what design thinking is, and where are they going to get that from if they're not getting it from you? You need to help and advise them about building new structures, changing the way that, that people operate, breaking down those departmental silos, and instead having cross-disciplinary working. And you can even introduce this kind of stuff on an informal basis, you know, like that proof of concept project. You might decide to kick that off um, by forming a, a cross-disciplinary group that comes together, and not a committee, but a group that actually works on the project together, that sits and operates. And if you've never come across Google Ventures design sprints, check that out. That's a great way of starting to encourage cross-departmental thinking. So increasingly, we're going to need to change the way we work and the way we operate. And then there's going to be dealing with more of those informal cultural elements, encouraging a culture that embraces making mistakes, taking risks, iterating and improving and those kinds of things. And I talk in the book um, quite a lot about ways of doing that. But again, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so we won't get into that here. Instead, I want to end with some real fast paced um, uh, suggestions about how you can make improvements, right? And these are based on a set of cards that I've produced that go with the book. So if you buy the book, you'll get a PDF of all of these cards. They're also available online for free, and I'll give you the URL at the end. And I'm about to produce them in, in printed form that you can buy if you so want to. But I'm going to give you a really quick rundown um, of these. And these are bits of inspiration. Um, oh, thank you, by the way, Christian, for sharing that uh, design sprint link. Wonderful. Um, uh, so these these are um, really quick tips of, of, of things that you can do. Each card has its own tip on, all right, for creating a user-centric culture. First one is show, don't tell, right? So that's the principle I was talking about earlier um, with um, uh, the, the, the prototype, the Disney band prototype. So we're talking about things like prototyping, visualizing unit user journey, getting colleagues to complete user tasks. I'll give you an example. I worked with a designer once, right? Lovely guy um, who was working on an e-commerce site aimed at an elderly audience, all right? And um, we were working on the design and he was doing beautiful design, really lovely design, but I had problems with it. I had accessibility concerns. All his links were very close together and the color contrast wasn't good enough and so that kind of stuff. And I wonder, I was trying to get across to him that, you know, an elderly audience has arthritis and visual impairment problems. And I was telling him this and it wasn't sinking in. So I decided to show him it. So I made him wear ski gloves and I made him put on a pair of reading glasses, even though he didn't need them. So his vision was blurred. His hands were awkward and, and difficult to use because of the ski gloves. And I told him to use his website and he couldn't. Right. So that is an example of showing someone, finding a way to show them rather than just telling them. Another uh, piece of advice I would give is to get colleagues in front of users. And again, I've said this. So open usability sessions, record and share those sessions if people can't make them or do what the government digital service does and make those sessions mandatory. They say if you don't spend two hours every six weeks with a customer, you are not a, you do not get to be a stakeholder. You don't get to say have a say in the development of that product because you haven't been exposed to users. You don't know what's going on. So those kinds of um, uh, you know, experiments are, are, are really good. They're oh, ways of tips, ways of working are really good. Nothing is more uh, uh, powerful than getting colleagues in front of users. Another thing you can do is workshop with stakeholders. Take every opportunity to involve them in the process, right? We tend to keep people at, at arm's length because we're worried they're gonna screw stuff up. But that does nothing to change the culture. It does nothing to change the stakeholders to encourage them to be more user centric. So we need to find ways of including them. 
to workshop the customer journey with your colleagues across the organization, to collaboratively wireframe together, to do something I call the user attention point exercise. And, and I, I haven't got time to get into that in this presentation, but if you Google my name and user attention points, you'll find it. Alternatively, we can talk about it in the Q&A time afterwards. But all these different exercises you can do to, to teach and educate stakeholders, but to involve them as well. Because the more involved they are, the greater sense of ownership they have, the more likely they are to back what it is they're doing. But most of all, really, I think we need to become educators and not just implementers, that we are trying to promote and be advocates of the user experience within our organization, just rather than sitting there just trying to build stuff for users, we need to help the organization understand users and embrace users. So we need to write newsletters and blogs. We need to you know, use guerrilla tactics like the replacing pictures I talked about earlier. We need to be giving lunchtime presentations and considering running internal conferences and all of these kinds of things. Now, all of this takes time, and I'm aware of that, and you might say that you don't have time, but I've blogged about how ways of finding time for stuff like this, and again, if you search on time and my name, you'll no doubt find it, or drop me an email, and I'll send you a link. There are ways of finding time for this kind of stuff. And then another tip is to target the selfish gene, because here's the thing. If you want to convince others about the value of user experience, you're wasting your time. Trying to convince management or colleagues to care about the user is really hard. Instead, focus on the things they already care about, right? So things like getting their end of year bonus or, or improving the conversion rates on the site or whatever it is that they care about. And show them how a better user experience will actually help them achieve their goals. Right? How a better user experience will lead to increased revenue, which means they'll get their bonus, or how a better user experience will inc increase conversion rates, etc. Right? So don't try and change people, but instead latch on to what, what they already consider important. You make use of data as well. Have you got clearly established key performance indicators so that you know whether you, what you're doing is succeeding or failing? Establish a culture of let's test. So whenever there's disagreement over a design, don't just get into a fight about it, but say, let's do a quick A-B test. Let's compare. Let's put this in front of users and let users decide. Because it shifts the conversation away from an internal power struggle or internal thinking to being external focused, to, to thinking about the user and how the user will respond to things. Also, link user experience to a company-wide strategy. You'll often find that management have written some kind of con uh, management um, or company strategy somewhere. Probably something that you've shoved in a drawer the minute you've got it or filed it away because it, it's felt like business gobbledygook to you. But this document shows what your management team care about, what they want to achieve. So all you need to do now is link user experience design with achieving the objectives that are laid out in that strategy. And if you can do that, they're much more likely to be open and receptive to it. You can also change the way you work, right? You might not be able to change the company, but you can change how you operate within the company. So you can ask people not to send you functional specifications, but instead work with them to create user tasks that you want whatever it is to, to fulfill. You can make testing a mandatory part of what you do. Just like you do, you know, the fact that you use Photoshop or Sketch, you also use usability testing. It's just how you work. You can establish some design principles like we talked about earlier that help define the way you work and operate and formalize it in some kind of way. But you can also focus on close collaboration, right? Interview your colleagues, right? Go and talk to them. Embed the, the, your clients in your team. Don't let them just give you a brief and then walk away, but get them involved in the team um, and active in the team. Then there's those design sprints I mentioned earlier. Occasionally, you might want to make use of outside experts, people like me. Not because um, we know more than you, we absolutely don't, but um, there is something about an outside expert, an outside person, um, management just don't pay as much attention to their own staff. It's wrong, but it's the way it is. They see you as biased, all right? They see um, you as pushing an agenda. 
But by getting it, making use of an outside expert, even if it's just to quote us rather than actually getting us in, has a credibility to it, right? That you can leverage and you can make use of yourself. Quoting bits out of my book, for example, adds a credibility and independence that you can't bring. So let's summarize before we wrap up. Remember, this is the get a long game, right? Your organization is not going to change overnight. This is a marathon and a not a sprint. And you, it's really about finding like-minded people where you establish um, shared values and then together start raising the profile of the customer, together creating a vision for the future before you ever talk to management. But when you do take, uh, talk to management, have small asks, go to them with solutions and not problems. Then work on a proof of concept to really demonstrate the benefit of user experience. Then after that, you can start working on organizational culture by looking at metrics, looking at structure, and looking at that kind of unofficial culture that exists. This isn't an easy find, but I'm fed up with scenarios like United Airlines, right? I'm fed up with seeing bad experience all the time that's unnecessary. And I honestly believe the user experience is the next big change. And if we don't embrace it, um, if organizations don't get it, then they're going to go out of business. You might conclude that for you personally, it's too much work. Then move. Don't stay in a company that doesn't appreciate user experience design. Go somewhere that does. But if you choose to stay where you are, then fight. Fight for a better user experience. Because you, no matter what your position in an organization, can make change. And that's what my book is about. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to fail. As Churchill supposedly once said, um, success is going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And I would really encourage you to keep going no matter how tough things get. Okay, now I just want to encourage you to pop in some comments. Um, uh, uh, um, but there's a couple of things before um, we, you do that that I want to say. First of all, um, although this is a free presentation, I am raising a little bit of money um, uh, for charity while I do that. Let me just pop over here and hopefully I can um, uh, prompt you now. I don't know whether that's worked. I, I don't understand. I've never done this before. So um, I prompted you uh, to make a contribution, apparently. Um, this is a charity that raises money for um, children in India um, to improve their education, especially girls. I'll let you check out the website. If you want to make a donation, um, if you found this presentation useful, that's absolutely wonderful, but you don't feel need to oblige to. If you want to know more about the book, you can go to UX um, uh, book, for, yeah, boag, boag world forward slash UX book, and you can get that there. Um, then there's also the cards that I mentioned. If you want those, boag.world forward slash UX dash culture. Um, and there's the set of cards there. So that is basically it for um, uh, the presentation. Let's have a look at what questions we've got. Don't forget you can vote questions up and down. When is a good time to take, oh no, I need to, I need to actually click on the, the, the question to start answering it. Um, do you have any advice on moving from a technical role into a user experience one? Right, I'm gonna immediately say something controversial. Um, which is that I think you're already in a user experience role if you come from a technical background. I would say actually that developers impact the user experience just as much as designers, if not more. Um, uh, performance, for example, is one area where um, user experience is hugely, hugely um, impacted by good or bad performance. Um, so I actually think you're already doing it. Um, if you want to move more into that side, if by that you mean things like interface design or um, organizational change and that kind of thing, in my experience, the best way of doing it is just to start doing it. It's not to wait for permission, not to wait officially for your job title to change, but just start talking about this stuff. Just start caring about this stuff. Just bringing, a lot of it is just about bringing um, up the subject of the user and the user's needs in meetings and um, at every opportunity to say, what will users think about that? Let's test that. That's really all that is involved a lot of the time. So that's personally where I would begin. Um, I don't know what some other people have said, 
um, in the in the comments. Maybe you guys can carry on talking about that at a later time. Um, let's do that one. We may revisit some of these. I've no idea. Let me have a look how many questions there are. Okay, there's there's a few. Okie dokie. Right, so that's that question. Uh, one thing I should say is the video of this presentation is going to be available afterwards. Um, that any of you can watch it if you want to. Right. What's the most favorite technique you apply um, in your discovery workshops? Good one. Uh, it depends whether or what you mean by a discovery workshop, because um, obviously different people do different things. Um, one of my favorite techniques is actually the user attention point exercise I talked about earlier, right? One of the big problems is, is that everybody's looking at their own agendas, right? So, um, and, and this often comes to a head when you come to design pages, right? Home page is a great example of this, right? The marketing department wants this on the home page. The, the CEO wants this on it. The salespeople want this on it. This product department wants this on it. This group on that. And you end up with far too much. And nobody's thinking about the user. So what you do is you get all of these people together into a room and you run the user attention point exercise. And essentially what this, this exercise involves um, is saying, look, users have a limited amount of attention, right? Everybody, does everybody agree with that? And everybody nods, right? Yes, of course they do. They know from their own experience that people have got limited attention. They know it in their heads, but it doesn't translate into what they do. So we need to show them. Okay, so we've established that. Occasionally you get some smart aleck that argues with you. Um, but a very quick Google, um, especially on BBC, I think BBC wrote a great um, article a while back, as I remember, about how people make a decision about a website in a matter of milliseconds and we've got the attention of a goldfish and that kind of thing. So it is relatively easy to prove that. To them. And then you say, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to represent that limited attention with 17 points, right? Now, I pull 17 out of my arse. It seems to be a number that works quite well. Don't ask me to justify it. I can't really. Um, but we have 17 points of user attention. Um, every element that you choose to add to a particular page, let's say we're doing the home page. Um, if, in fact, let's back up a bit, right? Before you tell them about the 17 points, you say, well, look, first of all, let's let's just brainstorm everything that could go on this page, right? Um, oh, no, unable to accept donations. That's dreadful. Is that by clicking on the link in, in here? Oh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, oh, no, that is dreadful. Try going straight to Bethesda-project.org um, and just donate directly through there, if that's all right. It'll all come. I get notified about it all anyway. Sorry about that, guys. Um, right, so... Sorry, that was a tangent. Stay focused. Um, so you start off by saying to them, uh, users are limited attention, but let's get down everything that, that um, a user might want to include. And so you actually make it a game. You split people into teams. You have a, um, you have a prize for the people, person or group that can come up with the most things, right? The most things that they might want to include on the homepage. Um, so you end up with a massive list, right? A huge list of potential um, uh, things that people might want to want to include. And then you say, ah, OK, so we know the user's got limited attention and we know we've got a list of things that's too long. So let's represent user's attention in terms of points. And we're going to establish 17 points. Every element that's added onto the page costs at least one point. OK, if, however, you include um, if you want one thing to be more important than another, you have to give it more points, right? So if, I don't know, the logo is more important than the footer, it has to have more uh, points, right? More of the user's attention sp um, spent on it. So um, as a result, what happens then is they go, go and they start spending their 17 points, right? And, and they'll make some hard decisions and they'll cross off some things from their long list of stuff that could be included. And they'll feel like they're doing really well. And they'll go through and they'll start spending their points and they'll spend one point here, and one point here, and one point here, maybe two points here, and one point here. And they'll spread their points as thinly as possible. 
And then after you they've done that, then what you do is you turn around to them and you say, um, uh, um, you say, you've you've done a great job. You've got rid of loads of stuff off the list. Um, but I just want to show you a couple of websites. You show them the Google homepage and you show them the Yahoo homepage and you say, which of these two sites is better, right? Everybody always says Google. And you said to them, well, unfortunately, you've just created Yahoo, right? You've spread your points, your attention really thinly with lots of different things competing with one another. Google has spent all of their points on their search box. And I promise you that every time I do that, it's like a light bulb going on in people's heads. They, they suddenly get and understand the, the, the concept, right? The idea of limited user attention, right? Or how the user thinks. And then you get them to redo the exercise and then they make the tough decisions. Then they remove things. Now they might complain that you haven't given them enough. Uh, um, you haven't given them enough points, and you simply say, "Well, I've done that to demonstrate the point and the exercise." You can let them have some more points if they moan enough. I don't care, but it will demonstrate the idea. So definitely try that out. I find that a really useful technique. All right, that's that one. What we got next? Number four boats. What's the best way to understand the user when your customers are not direct end users and for some reason are unwilling to let you be in touch with the end users directly? Okay, um, there are good reasons sometimes why your client doesn't want you talking to their customers. There can be confidentiality agreements, there can be NDAs, there can be um, just these people are really busy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you have to do, what I, I tend to do in this situation, is I work with internal, right, first of all, I find people within the organization that are interacting and dealing with customers on a regular basis, right? So people in customer support, people in sales, people like that. And I sit down and I work with them to create a set of personas, right? Or a persona that, that represents the customer. Then I go out and I find people that fulfill that persona. So they might not be customers, but they're similar people, all right? And I use those as my sample customers for making, um, you know, for, for, for doing things like design testing and stuff like that. But I would say that actually finding demographically accurate customers, I mean, it is important. Don't get, I'm not downplaying it. But it's more important for some things than others, right? So if you're talking about tone or design or content and those kinds of things, then I think it's more important to get accurate people, right? If you're talking about usability, just basic usability, can I navigate around this? Can I find this and stuff like that? Unless you've got a particularly unusual audience, like someone who's very old or very young, then pretty much most of us face the same kind of problems. And it's not going to be hugely different if your audience isn't 100% demographic. So I guess the message that I'm, I'm sharing there is just because you can't access real customers doesn't mean you should just give up on talking to customers at all or people at all, right? Even talking to someone completely random outside of the project that's got no interaction or knowledge of the project or the company will be hugely beneficial, right? Even if they're totally wrong, the wrong type of person. So test, test your stuff with somebody even if it's not the right person. Now, if it's not the right person, obviously you're gonna to have to take it with a, a, a pinch of salt and you're gonna to have to be careful you don't make assumptions. But I think just the act of talking to other people will open your mind up to stuff. Right, there's that one. Oh, scrolling, whoa. Three votes. Um, Right. When is it a good time to take things offline and bring some users in to talk to them as soon as possible? Um, the, you should be testing a little and often, right? You should be talking to customers a little and often, even if you're only talking to two, three uh, customers at any one time. Um, the more the more rounds you do, the more conversations you have, the more important it is, right? Because the um, what happens is you talk to a set of users who that uncover a load of problems for you. Now, if you just do that 
once, you're going to find one set of problems, okay? But if you do that, then fix those problems and test again, that second round of testing is going to reveal a new set of problems to you, all right? So each round is going to reveal more and more. So the more rounds you do, the better. It's almost more important to do more rounds than it is to have you know, more people in each round. So that's one aspect of it. Um, when is a good time? The sooner, the earlier you start testing with real users, the easier it is to fix, right? It's easy to fix a sketch. It's easy to fix a design comp. It's easy to fix a prototype. It's not easy to re-engineer an entire website when it's done. So the, so the early stages are more important ultimately in testing than the later ones. Okay, done. What else we got? Let's go for order this one. Um, if you have staff buy-in uh, to view usability testing, but they sometimes see a problem with the users as opposed to your own design, what would you suggest? Yeah, this goes back almost, Brian, to the, to the thing I said earlier about it all depends on what you're testing about, right? If you're testing visuals and, and aesthetics and that kind of stuff, um, then, um, then yes, getting demograph demographically accurate people is good. And what you want to ideally do in those kinds of situations is go for numbers, right? So when you're doing design testing, you know, do you like design A or do you like design B? Does design A tie in with the right set of keywords? Those kinds of tests, you know what I mean? Um, then I would make use, I would do those online normally. I do them as surveys or as a kind of A-B choice things using Facebook followers, that kind of thing. Because when you get numbers, any weakness in any one particular customer is offset by the overall numbers. Does that make sense, right? So those are unfacilitated, um, unobserved tests, basically, like a survey. When you're talking about things like um, uh, usability testing, well, I've already said that actually the demographics don't actually matter that much, right? Because we all encounter similar problems. And essentially, anybody outside of the organization, even if they are um, not the perfect demographic, is going to be able to make a clearer and better decision than internal staff are who are too close to the project. So what I would do is, before you even go into the situation, discuss with, uh, discuss with your client um, uh, this idea that we're too close, right? And include yourself. We're too close. Um, and, and so that's why we're doing testing, okay? And say that before you go in and, and get them to agree, yeah, yeah, that we are, you know, can't see the wood for the trees kind of thing, right? Now when we go in and they then suddenly start feeling uncomfortable because this person isn't saying what they want it to say, so they make up some bullshit about the person not being accurate, well, you say, well, they're not as close as we are, therefore, even though they're not perfect, their opinion is better than ours. You see what I've done? Um, if you say that once they've already expressed their opinion, it's hard for them to go back, right? They'll start arguing their corner. But because you've had the conversation beforehand, you've already, you know, established the, the baseline that anyone who's less involved with than you is better able to see the bigger picture. I don't know whether I've explained that very well, Brian, but it's the best I can manage at the moment. Okay. Um, Right. Um, Martin's asking, I ordered the book at Smashing Magazine. Is there a way to get the cards? Um, if you ordered, um, you should have been given them as part of the, um, um, the oh, blah, blah, blah. you should have got them as when you got the ebook. They should have all come in the same bundle. Um, if they haven't, for whatever reason, um, I think, well, actually, you just posted a link. Patrick, you've just posted the link publicly to everybody who um, uh, wants them. So there you go. Even if you haven't got the book, you can now download the uh, PDF cards for free. Although I was encouraging people to donate to charity to get those books. Damn you. No, I forgive you. That's not a problem. Okay. What does Tim Ferriss, my favorite person? Tim Ferriss often talks about um, finding the first domino, the key action or piece of information that will have the most impact. When uh, you have brought in as an outside expert to an organization at the very beginning of your journey, where do you start? What action is your first domino? Okay, um, Mark, stop listening to Tim Ferriss. 
Um, but saying that aside, um, he's yes, he has kind of got a point on this one. My first action is always to talk to the in-house digital people, right? Those people always know the answers already, right? Without fail. They know everything that's wrong with the site. They understand all the things that are blocking it from happening. They just can't move past that point. They're stuck at that point. So your first action always has to be to talk to the internal people. Um, now, you might be the internal people. And Mark, I know you're not, but, but other people might be. So what's your first domino? For you, I think the first domino is to find somebody at the executive level that you think will be most receptive um, to the idea of user experience being important, right? And that might not be because they've expressed an interest in user experience, but you know that they care about something that you can help solve through user experience. Remember that selfish gene card I talked about earlier, right? So first of all, find that person and get that person on board, right? That would be my first domino there. Okay, we're nearly done. Right. What can you recommend for improvements to a career in UX designer? Are there qualification certificates um, which potential employers look for? I don't believe there are in most cases, Dan. Um, I mean, I'm not the best person to ask because I did my education 25 years ago, something like that, maybe even a bit longer now. Um, so I'm obviously not up on the latest, but certainly when I hire user experience designers, I don't care about their qualifications. I care about the work that they've done um, and where they've worked. Um, but I know if you're looking at a large organization, um, many large organizations um, do look for qualifications because they've got out of date HR um, departments that don't really know how to hire staff other than via qualifications. If you're lucky, you, you find an organization like IBM that essentially are training you up and will take you through that process of becoming a user experience designer. So I don't think there are particularly, uh, but I'm sure someone will correct me on that. Okay, let's do the last question from Dylan and then we'll wrap this baby up. Here's a thought, at the risk of being told I'm a JavaScript hipster, would you agree that real time, Isomorphic technologies are more user friendly. Uh, yes, no. I don't. I don't even know what real time isomorphic technologies are, Dylan. I think you're a bit too clever for me. I'm sorry. That's my answer to your question. Goodbye. Okay. I think that about covers everything. I'm sorry the um, the the donation thing didn't work. Um, please donate. Please, please donate at Bethesda-project.org. Doesn't matter whether it's big, small, um, uh, they would be incredibly grateful. And I, for one, um, will. I, I'm informed about every donation that you will make, even if you've come elsewhere, because I ran their whole site, so I see every donation that goes in. Um, so yeah, that would be really lovely, because they're a tiny little charity, and you know, the smallest amount of money makes an enormous difference to them. Um, read about them there. But thank you very much. If you've got a choice between donating to the charity or buying my book, go on, I'd say it. Donate to the charity. Um, if you decide you want the cards, don't download them from the PDF in the comments. Go to my website, download them there where you can buy them. Um, and the money, 100% of the money goes to this same charity as well. Okay, I think I've, I've done enough preaching at you and, and telling you to, to part with your cash. Um, I really appreciate you guys turning up. It is absolutely wonderful. Um, I will post to Twitter in a few minutes time the link to this. Um, you might receive an email as well and you can watch it back as many times as you like. Aren't you lucky folks? But thank you for coming along um, and I hope it was useful. Goodbye.